Good evening. I'm Noreen Hersfeld, Nicholas and Bernice Ruder Professor of Science and Religion here at St. John's and St. Ben's. And it is my great pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Jennifer Wiseman. Dr. Wiseman earned her bachelor's degree in physics from MIT. And while she was doing undergraduate research there, she discovered a new periodic comet. So it's now named the Wiseman Skiff Comet. So those of you students who are doing undergraduate research, you know, it's worthwhile. You could get something named after you. She went on to do a PhD in astronomy from Harvard University. And she's currently the a senior astrophysicist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And she serves as the senior project scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope. She previously headed the Laboratory for Exoplanets and Stellar Astrophysics. Dr. Wiseman is also deeply involved in science policy and public outreach and engagement. She served as a Congressional Science Fellow for the American Physical Society, an elected counselor of the American Astronomical Society, and a public dialogue leader for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She's appeared in many science and news venues, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, NOVA, and National Public Radio. I've known Jennifer through her work in science and religion. She is a member of several different science and religion groups, and she only in the last year stepped down from the position of director for the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences Dialogue in Science and Religion Project, which our School of Theology here at St. John's just completed a three-year grant with on science in the seminaries. I've heard Jennifer speak on numerous occasions, so I know you're in for a real treat tonight. So without further ado, please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Jennifer Wiseman. Thank you, Professor Hertzfeld. Thank you for all of you for coming out tonight. Um, and of course, if circumstances were perfect, we wouldn't be in here. We would be outside looking up at a beautiful, clear night, dark night sky, and enjoying the heavens the natural way, which is my favorite kind of astronomy, is actually just going up and being awestruck by just looking up at the night sky. Um, but unfortunately, often the conditions around us don't allow that. Either it's cloudy, like it is today, or um, the light pollution that we have created by all of our own city lights and street lights have basically created a glow in the, in the night air that makes it very hard to see very many stars. Um, so we have cheated ourselves out of seeing uh, the beauty of the heavens and being awestruck as people in former generations were able to do. The flip side of that, though, is that our technology today enables us to use professional telescopes to see amazing detail in the deep universe that we would never be able to see with our own eyes. So we're going to explore some of that this evening. Um, I'm here tonight not representing any organization that I work for so that I can share with you not only the wonder and awe, but some of my own reflections on what it might mean for uh, how we think of ourselves in this vast universe. So let's, let's get started. Um, I'm just going to cover a few things like galaxy stars, planets, life, dark matter, dark energy, and <laughs> everything. Uh, we start... And I should have asked this long before now, but I don't know if it's possible to dim the lights in the room a little bit. Um, uh, if it is, we can certainly enjoy the images a little bit better. But this is a picture of stars. Um, it's a cluster of stars called a globular cluster. Globular clusters are very dense, like a beehive of stars that are held close to each other by their mutual gravity, but they don't just clump together because they also have 
independent velocity. So they're swarming around. And in this case, the cluster, oh, that's better, getting better, getting better. Um, the, uh, the cluster is being viewed by the newest camera that was put on the Hubble Space Telescope, which enables us to get a very sharp picture. Is that, is that better for people to see? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Now, <laughs> um, so by having a telescope above the clouds and above the blurring effects of our own atmosphere, we're able to get sharper resolution. That means that instead of just seeing all this starlight kind of jumbled together, we're able to pick out the individual stars in this very crowded cluster. And it's beautiful. And I like to ask people at this juncture what they notice about these stars. Anybody brave enough to yell out what you notice? Different colors, yeah, okay. And what, what else do you notice? There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them, yes. What else? How do they differ from each other? Brightness. There are differences in brightness. And, um, yeah, they, they look like they're different sizes. Sometimes that's just really an effect of there being different brightnesses. But, yeah, they appear to be different sizes. They are different sizes. So uh, which ones do you think are the hottest ones? Blue ones. Ah, correct. Okay, someone's got good sun. Usually that's a trick question, but blues are the hottest ones. They're all hot. They're all stars, so you don't want to get close to them. If our sun were in this picture, it would be like one of the smaller whitish, greenish dots, but our sun is not in such a crowded uh, situation. But here you can see how the technology that's given us the chance to resolve individual stars in a crowded cluster like this also gives us a chance to see beauty. To me, these look like a collection of gemstones, and uh, um, they're very beautiful. And you can see that stars are different, and we can go f a little bit farther with the science and take each star and look at it spectroscopically, so we take the light like through a prism, and spread it out into its constituent colors or frequencies, and that gives us much more information about the composition of the star, what's, what kinds of atoms are in that star, and what different proportions, and how old the star is, and so forth. So we can then get a, a handle on the different populations of stars that are interweaved throughout this one cluster. So we can do a lot more detailed science as well as well as, as enjoying the beauty, a juxtaposition of technology giving us more knowledge, which also gives us a greater sense of awe, wonder, and appreciation of beauty. It's all intertwined here. Here's another uh, image that I particularly like of beauty. And while the cluster I just showed you is of old stars, some of these stars are almost as old as, as our galaxy itself. Um, by the way, uh, you, uh, let me digress for a moment here. There are uh, different kinds of stars, as we've just described here, and there is a New Testament verse that says that star differs from star in splendor. And if you can identify that verse, you get extra credit at the end of the lecture. Um, this is a beautiful image of not old stars, but new stars. So the one, the picture I just showed you are some of the oldest stars in the galaxy. These stars, this is a cluster of them, have recently formed. They form, stars form when little pockets of gas begin to collapse under their own gravitational pull. So it turns out our galaxy, which contains hundreds of billions of stars, is also filled with a lot of wispy gas between all those stars. We call it the interstellar medium. And there's dust in there, too. And most of it's just very wispy and turbulent. But occasionally, you'll get a little eddy or a little clump that's denser. And if it's dense enough, the weight, the, 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 the mass of that material will actually feel itself, gravity's always trying to pull matter together, and we'll pull clumps of this gas together into little, little clumps or clouds. If there's enough material, the pressure will be so high that it will spawn a reaction in the core of that little clump of gas called fusion. 
And with fusion, you have a series of reactions. Most of the atoms are hydrogen. The hydrogen atoms fuse and form helium. The products of these reactions continue on. You'll get things like carbon and oxygen eventually, eventually iron. And one of the products of these reactions is, is light, photons of light that are released eventually from that clump of fusing gas. So that's what we call a star. It's a little factory. It's a factory that's producing heavier elements and also light. And I think these are uh, beautiful little factories. And here you have a bunch of these stars bigger than our sun that have coalesced out of this interstellar gas. They've turned on through this process of fusion. And they're sending back into their surrounding environment winds that come off the stars and that kind of blow away some of the leftover wispy gas around it. But some of that gas is denser than others parts. So you see little pillars here and there. You see kind of one in the lower left and another one down here in the lower right. These are clumps of gas that are a little bit denser. So they hang on a little bit longer in that torrent of winds from the newly formed stars. And they protect behind them these sort of pillar-like wakes of, of gas. So often you see these pillars are always pointing back to the massive stars. And of course, this is the denser gas where you might expect that more stars could form, more gas could coalesce. The lower mass stars, so kind of like the mass of our sun, take longer to form than those big massive ones in the middle. So they're still forming within those denser clumps and pillars. We also see the beautiful colors. So it turns out that the light from these massive stars that have formed is energetic enough to, when it hits the surrounding gas, it ionizes some of the atoms. That means it separates the electrons from the protons, and when those atoms recombine, they emit visible light, often in these beautiful colors. So when astronomers see a region like this, we say, wow, that's beautiful. And we also say, wow, this is a re region of recent star formation because you still have some leftover gas uh, that you can see ionized there, and you expect that there's some ongoing star formation. So by recent, I mean that you know these massive stars have formed within the last few hundred million years, so they're not spring chickens. Um, but some of them perhaps are less than a million years old. And the universe is over 13 billion years old, so they, they are rather recent in terms of the cosmos. All right, so how did I get involved in this business? Um, well, I uh, did not grow up in a family of scientists. Uh, I, in fact, I grew up in a small town in north central Arkansas. We didn't even have a university at that time anywhere near my small town. My parents were not able themselves to go to college, but they made sure that their children were able to, so I'm grateful for that. But this is what I saw most days when I was home. This is me in the winter feeding our cattle in the Ozarks of Arkansas, bundled up for the cold. And on this farm that I grew up, I think how I got into science was really through a love of nature, right? So science is really the systematic study of nature here are some photos I recently took from that same farmland that I try to get back to as often as I can. And it just shows you some of the beauty. Every day is different there. That, you know, every day I see different flowers or different seasons of the year. We see different things in the forest, the water, the skies. Um, I love all animals, whether they are livestock or pets or wildlife. And watching the rhythms of nature, including the night sky, I think developed in me a real love for, for nature. And science became a kind of a natural way to study systematically the natural world. Now, I didn't know any scientists, nor did I know how you would become a scientist, nor did I know what you would do if you became a scientist, so I didn't know any of that. But I did have encouraging people in my family who encouraged me to try to you know, pursue whatever interested me and, and, and to reach high. And I particularly appreciate my older brother, Mike, and his wife. They're no longer living, but they were greatly encouraging to me to, uh, to pursue science if that interested me. And then 
my high school teachers uh, were very encouraging and kind of gave us a healthy sense of confidence that we could and should uh, learn and pursue whatever we were interested in and they would support us. My church, I grew up in a loving church family that um, while we didn't you know, know much about professional science, we did understand and think of the natural world as God's creation and so science would be a way of honoring God by studying the details of God's creation. And we also understood scripture, the Bible, we took it very seriously. And, uh, but we also understood that some of the details of the natural world had not been revealed in scripture, that God had given us the gift of science to learn some of those details. So we had some humility, I think, as, as we thought about how to, how to think about the Bible um, in a respectful way. So I think all of that helped me to have the, the confidence to go on and pursue scientific study. And I was particularly interested in space because when I was growing up, we had uh, the first close-up pictures were coming back to Earth from the Voyager probes. These were probes that NASA had sent to the outer solar system to fly by some of the gas giant planets like Jupiter and take close-up pictures not only of the planet but of their moons. So we were getting these pictures of these exotic worlds like Europa and Io, Ganymede, these, these moons orbiting the outer planets, exotic worlds that I was fascinated by and I wanted to be a part of that enterprise. I didn't know how to do that and I didn't know whether I should be an engineer or a scientist or try to be an astronaut or what, but I kind of wanted to be a part of that. And the first Star Wars movies were coming out too, so everybody was thinking about space. So space was on everybody's mind. Anyway, I was able to go on to, to, uh, to college and um, went a long way from home. But I uh, majored in physics because it's kind of a basic science. It kept my options open, and I could apply it to many things. I didn't really know what to go into. But later in my undergraduate years, I took my first intro astronomy class well into my college years and just began to learn the basics. But that was enough to help me see that I was really interested in scientific study of the universe, and then I applied to graduate school. And I wish somebody told me, but graduate schools in, in physical sciences often will cover your expenses. So, so that's a really nice uh, thing to know. If you get through your undergraduate school and you want to go to graduate school in science, often that will be covered by your graduate school. And I also didn't know, like, well, how do you choose a science project if you... You know, I had this vision of a lonely scientist doing their work all by themselves and thinking up some hypothesis and then going off and testing it. And I was like, well, how do I know that nobody else around the world has ever thought of the same hypothesis that I had? You know, how does that work? But how it works, I wish somebody had told me, is that you work, you, you, you start your working with a professor as an advisor who brings you into a group and you learn how the science is done. And then they help direct you toward participating in a research project that is new and needed and fresh and show you how to contribute to that. And, and so when I learned that process, it really helped me to finish my graduate degree and become a professional scientist. And as part of that, in my case, I had to learn how to use professional telescopes. So astronomers use different kinds of observatories. These are some examples here. Uh, we use observatories in space and on the ground. So the one on top there is the Hubble Space Telescope, which is probably the most famous telescope. It's been operating for 33 years, longer than many of you have been alive, but it is still very fresh because we've sent astronauts up to it time and time again to refresh it, to repair things, and to put in new science instruments. But there are many other telescopes that either are or have been in space as well, seeing different kinds of light, like X-ray emission, and uh, uh, Hubble sees visible light, and ultraviolet light, and a little bit of infrared light, and now the new Webb telescope sees deeper into the infrared part of the spectrum of light than Hubble can see. The lower right there is an example of radio telescopes, so I was originally trained in how to use an array of radio telescopes uh, to do my own research in star formation, but this array is in South America, and it's very powerful observatories peering into dense clouds of gas in galaxies where new stars are forming. 
The lower left are examples of, of optical and infrared telescopes that are on the ground that are still very useful in their own niche. So these are the Keck telescopes in Hawaii. Astronomers typically use observatories kind of like a, 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 a like a orchestra conductor uses different instruments to draw out different parts of the music and then all together it creates a beautiful uh, piece of harmony. Well, if an astronomer is studying a planet or a star or galaxies, they typically will use different types of facilities to pick up different kinds of light or different kinds of information and then they bring that all together for their scientific study and conclusions. So here are uh, astronauts uh, on the last servicing mission for the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, uh, taking out old cameras, uh, putting in new instruments and repairing some of the older instruments. They did a fabulous job, so the Hubble Telescope is still in tremendous shape. It's, it's as scientifically productive as ever now, even 33 years into its mission. And its capabilities, seeing visible light and ultraviolet light, complement the capabilities of the new James Webb Space Telescope. The Webb Telescope is an infrared telescope. It sees different kinds of light that complement what other telescopes can see to give us more information. This telescope was launched um, in, on uh, Christmas Day in, in uh, 2021. And you can see the launch there, and you can see some some excited yet anxious NASA officials there in, in the lower right watching the launch from South America. This telescope looks different from Hubble. It's an infrared uh, collector with a larger diameter mirror, so it can be very sensitive to very faint light. Um, it can also, because of its broader diameter mirror, it can get similar resolution and sharpness to the Hubble Space Telescope at these different wavelengths. And you can see those uh, funny looking uh, tiers at the bottom, those are sun shields. They are uh, designed to keep the telescope cold, so those layers of shields, pink-looking shields, they are always between the telescope and the Earth and the Moon and the Sun to keep the telescope cold. And in fact, while the Hubble telescope is orbiting the Earth at low Earth altitudes, the Webb telescope is much farther away. So Hubble's about 350 miles up from the surface of the Earth. It's not very far up. The Webb telescope is a million miles away. It's, it's farther than the moon. And it's actually orbiting the sun. So it's, it's orbiting the sun along with the Earth, so always keeping the Earth on the same and sun on the same side of it as it orbits around. So uh, that's designed to keep it very, very cold. There it is. Uh, being put together in the clean room of Goddard Space Flight Center, and you can see the different segments of the mirror. It had to be built so that you could fold the whole thing up into a rocket fairing, and then after it was launched, it had to automatically unfold. So this was a real engineering feat. Okay, so with these telescopes, we are able to uh, achieve things that we could not achieve with our own naked eye or even with most telescopes on the ground, such as what I've shown you. And one thing that these uh, observations of the heavens are showing us are that we live in an incredible universe. And what we see inspires wonder and awe. I hope you're already feeling some of those feelings right now. So I'm going to start a little pattern now of just some of my own observations of what it feels like for what we're learning in the universe and how we might respond. So I'm going to talk about some qualities of the universe that we are finding, and then I'm going to mention some ways that we as human beings respond when we, uh, when we learn what we're observing, what we're, what we're seeing um, in the heavens. Okay, so you might respond differently. I'm just going to throw out some examples to get you thinking, not only just thinking, but also feeling. All right, I think I have seven of these. So the first one is that the universe is beautiful. All right, now beauty is not a word that we use in scientific discourse and astrophysics too much, but... It's definitely there, you know, we notice beauty and we can each define beauty a little bit different. 
But, you know, when we look at something like this, this is the, the Carina Nebula as seen with the Webb telescope, and it's right at the edge of the nebula, so you see that kind of cliff where the clouds uh, meet the, the, the less dense medium above it, and there are very bright stars above the image that are radiating down on this cloud edge, um, evaporating it away slowly, but you, if you look carefully in that dense gas, the reddish gas, you see the, the little pillars that I told you about pointing up toward the massive stars as they are being carved out, and we now know there are plenty of these lower mass, what we call protostars, still coalescing down in that red gas. The whole region is active, but it's also um, beautiful. And we can see these star-forming regions even in our little neighbor galaxy. So our sun is in the Milky Way galaxy, which has hundreds of billions of stars, but the Milky Way has some little sister galaxies, little dwarf galaxies that are orbiting around the Milky Way. Probably eventually we're gonna merge together with them. One of those is called the Large Magellanic Cloud, and this picture is showing you some lively activity in that little dwarf galaxy. The red region is one of these star-forming nebulae with massive stars that are stirring up and, and lighting up the gas. The left blue donut thing is actually just one massive star called a wolf Rye star. And these types of stars are kind of unstable and they episodically release their outer atmospheres. Um, and so you can see the latest expulsion and it looks kind of like a donut ring around this one massive star. All of this is to show you activity, both of the young stars still forming and this massive star that's actually aging. And then there are, as I mentioned, galaxies. Uh, galaxies are beautiful. They are collections of hundreds of billions of stars. In this case, a spiral galaxy called NGC 1309. We certainly know how to name things beautifully in astronomy. But NGC 1309 is a spiral, and we think our own Milky Way may look something like this. We can't get all the way out of our own galaxy yet to take a selfie, so we are looking around from inside but we think we live in a spiral galaxy. Galaxies like this um, have taken over time the shape of, of like a windmill with the spiral arms. The spiral arms are filled with these nebulae, like I've showed you in detail, these gas clouds that are forming stars. Well, often spiral galaxies have a lot of those star-forming nebulae throughout their spiral arms, uh, gas and dust uh, um, along those arms. There are so many stars as well interspersed in those clouds that in the middle, the starlight just all blends together. So you see that bright glow in the middle of the galaxy. And now we believe most galaxies in the very center have something called a supermassive black hole. This is a repository where old dead stars eventually migrate to the cores of galaxies. The gravity pulls them all together and they become so compact that, not, that light itself cannot escape the strong gravitational pull or the distortion of space that all this mass causes. Yet material can orbit around that region, as long as it doesn't get too close, um, in a normal fashion. So we can measure the orbits of stars around these central black holes, and that's how we know the, 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 how much mass is in the black hole, by how fast the stars have to orbit to keep from falling in. So now we, now we know that most of these galaxies have unseen supermassive black holes at the core, and these, the bright glow that you see here is stars outside of that core. And if you look carefully, you'll see some other galaxies in the background of this image. So um, these are beautiful in their own right, and just what we think of our own Milky Way, this is an artist's conception of the Milky Way that we live in, again with the spiral arms, the bright center with lots of starlight, and if you look toward the bottom of this image, you see a little arrow that says our solar system right near something we call the local arm or the Orion arm of the galaxy. So that's where our sun is and the planets that orbit our sun, like Earth. So um, you are here, you are there um, right now, um, orbiting one little star, and then that star system is orbiting around the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And now we know that there are other galaxies. We didn't know that, you know, we've only known that for the last century. So we live in kind of a privileged time 
Here are some of those other galaxies. This is the Webb telescope image of Stefan's Quintet, which are several galaxies that appear close to each other in the sky. However, only the ones on the right are actually close to each other. The galaxy on the left is actually a lot closer to us than the other galaxies. So it's just a visually close galaxy. But the galaxies lined up along the right are actually close to each other physically, and they're kind of starting to interact. It's like an interactive gravitational dance as they get close to each other, but they have a little bit of angular momentum, so they're swirling near each other, and they're actually siphoning material off between each other. So between those top two galaxies, you can see a band of red emission. That's dust and gas that one galaxy is pulling off from another as they get too close to each other and there's gravitational pull. The Webb telescope can see the glowing uh, dust, warm dust from that kind of interaction. All right, so how do we respond to this beauty? Well, I would say one way that some of us respond with, with of course, awe and wonder, we've already mentioned that, but I would say, I hope, with a sense of joy that we're able to see this kind of beauty. And for many people, that evokes a, a praise. And I like to bring up at this point one of the most beautiful psalms in the Bible, Psalm 19, which is a psalm of praise that recognizes the heavens. Um, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. This is very poetic. Night after night, they reveal knowledge, yet they have no speech, they don't use words, no sound is heard from them, and yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Some kind of recognition that cultures all around the world look up at the sky, if we can get rid of the, the light pollution and see the sky, and have a unified sense that the heavens are giving us some kind of message without words. And what that message is, you know, it might be articulated differently in different cultures, but for everyone, I believe, there's a sense of amazement, a sense of humility that we have before the beauty and the magnitude of the universe all around us. All right, we talked about beauty. I would say that the universe is also active. I've already mentioned some of this, that stars are still forming. Um, let's look at one of those regions. This is a, a, a well-known constellation of the, in the sky taken by a telescope on the ground that sees a much wider swath of the sky than the Hubble or Webb telescopes can see. Does anybody know what constellation area this is? This is Orion, that's right. Um, and if you look at this, I grew up, again, out in the country, I could look up, and I thought this looked like a kite, with a kite and a kite string. And you know, there are no cosmic rules for constellations. You can make up your names for what you think a, an arrangement of star looks like. But, um, but this is more commonly known as Orion, the warrior or the hunter, where the bottom little swath there is, a, is like a, a sword. And you see the red Betelgeuse star up toward the top, which is an old red giant star, which could explode as a supernova any day now within the next few hundred thousand years. And the bright blue Rigel star in the lower right. But right along that kind of sword region there, even with binoculars, you can tell it's a little fuzzy. And astronomers call anything fuzzy a nebula. So we're going to zoom in on that little region where the arrow is pointed now with the Hubble telescope, which does not see this wide swath of the sky. It only sees that little pink area, but it sees, shows it in more detail. So when we look at that, what looks like one big red star with Hubble, we see this. And we see it's actually a beautiful lit up nebula, one of these star forming zones with massive stars, at least one of which is, is powerful enough to ionize the gas and give it the color. And behind this colorful region, there's actually a much larger dark cloud of dense gas. And I used radio telescopes for my own doctoral thesis to look through this lit up region and into that denser cloud where stars are forming, but they haven't yet turned on. So to see how protostars actually form. 
But even in this nebula that's now, you know, quite being stirred up by the stars that are fully formed, um, there are some lower mass stars that take longer to form that are still trying to coalesce in this torrent. And if you look closely, you'll see them. So I'm going to blow up a couple of them. Um, so here you see a couple of these little objects, and they're blown up. And you can see that they're surrounded by these dusty disks. So the one on the left is we're looking at it kind of face on. The one on the right, you know, they can be in different orientations, so that one's kind of edge on. But you see the bright glow of the, of the heating up uh, proto star, and then you see this dusty disk. Well, it turns out those disks are common around forming stars in our era, and they are about the diameter of our solar system. So it turns out that stars in our era of the universe form with these dusty disks around them, and it's out in those dusty disks that planetary systems form. So studying these protoplanetary disks and the planets that are forming within them is now a very hot topic in astronomy, including telescopes like the ALMA teles uh, observatory array, radio array I showed you earlier, and also the Webb telescope looking into the details of these disks. So we have star formation. Remember, we're in the, sec the section of the universe being active. Stars are forming. Planets are forming. Even the planets that have already formed are interesting, and they have moons. So um, here's one of the moons of planet Earth, a beautiful picture of Jupiter. Jupiter is a gas giant planet in our own solar system. It's much bigger than Earth. This is a Hubble image that gives you all the detail of the beautiful different latitude um, atmospheric stripes. There's the famous great red spot there. Um, that This is a giant hurricane. It's bigger than planet Earth. But we've been able to look at Jupiter in different ways now with the Hubble telescope and other telescopes. And one of them is to look in ultraviolet light. So this is the visible light, like our eyes can see. But if we add the ultraviolet light that Hubble can pick up that our eyes cannot, but this energetic light, we get this uh, showing up at the pole here. And the pole here is showing you, let me see if I can get it to, yeah. Um, the dancing lights of the aurora on the northern pole of Jupiter. So just like we have northern lights here, um, which I understand you can see here in Minnesota if you go out where it's dark, um, um, there are northern lights on Jupiter, and that's a product of Jupiter's strong magnetic field. So part of, you know, sometimes charged particles from the sun make it to Jupiter, interact with the magnetic field, get uh, interact especially at the magnetic poles where the magnetic field is, is based and create these aurora. They teach us something about the magnetic field on Jupiter. So Jupiter is active. We have a probe at Jupiter right now called Juno that's orbiting that system, taking measurements of its magnetic field, its gravitational field. Um, now we can look at this whole system also in infrared light with the Webb telescope. So there's the Hubble's visible light picture on the left, the Webb looking in infrared, and infrared light gives you some different diagnostics. So it's showing you some of the different temperatures and the contrast in temperature between uh, most of the bands of the atmosphere and the aurora at the north and the south and the great red spot there. So um, planetary scientists are really enjoying having this information. We also know from decades of Hubble observations that that giant red storm is shrinking over time and new storms are cropping up. So things are not stagnant even on the planets in our own solar system. I mentioned to you that stars are still forming, but stars also die. So um, stars carry on this fusion process for quite a long time. Um, which creates the light, but it also produces heavier elements beyond the hydrogen it starts with to helium, carbon, oxygen, iron, but eventually it runs out of that inner fuel, becomes unstable. Most stars simply release a lot of their outer atmosphere as they become unstable, so that's what's happening with this one star that's buried in the middle of this image. You can't see it, it's behind a little band of dust but it is actually releasing its outer atmosphere in a kind of bipolar fashion. So uh, it's kind of beautiful. So we call this the butterfly nebula for obvious reasons. 
So it's not only beautiful, but think about the fact that these heavier elements that the star has produced are now being expelled back into the interstellar gas and being, you know, uh, 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 churned up with the other gas. And then new generations of stars that form will form having not only just hydrogen, but some of these heavier elements that were produced by previous generations of stars. And in fact, the bigger stars, stars bigger than our sun, become so unstable when they run out of their inner fuel that they explode. And that's called a supernova. This is the remnant of a supernova explosion that happened a thousand years ago, but we're still seeing the debris from this star being ejected out. The different colors picked up by Hubble here point to different elements that were produced within the star or within the explosion itself. And these are going to be seeding the interstellar gas with the heavier elements that will make the next generations of stars more enriched, both in the content of the star, but also enabling these dusty disks with solids like silicon um, and iron to form around the star as the star forms. And that's the regions where solids like planets can form. So we needed subsequent genera uh, previous generations of stars so that we can have star systems like our own now that can have uh, uh, planets around them. So uh, uh, stars are what I call God's factories. They're, they're beautiful ways of producing not only light, but what we need for planets and life. All right, galaxies themselves are active because they interact. Here's a couple of galaxies that are being pulled together by their mutual gravitational attraction. And as we look into the distant universe, we're looking back in time and we're noticing that galaxy mergers are actually a very common way throughout the history of the universe for galaxies to grow. They um, typically are moving apart from each other as the universe expands, but if two galaxies are close enough, their mutual gravitational pull will dominate and they'll be pulled together, and that creates not only a bigger galaxy in the end, but it can actually stir up a lot of star formation. So here's two galaxies a little farther along in that process of merging, and that creates so much turbulence that it's stirring up the gas, compressing a lot of it, and really firing up these nebulae where new stars are forming. So you see the pinkish regions there of gas and dust. That's what we call a starburst, you know, a huge surge in the formation of new stars as these two galaxies merge and will eventually become one larger galaxy filled with fresh stars. Now, if you think this is beautiful and amazing but irrelevant, it turns out that our own Milky Way seems to be the product of previous mergers. We have different populations of stars in our own galaxy and we're on a head-on direct merging collision course with our nearest neighbor and uh, uh, spiral galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. So this, uh, um, our galaxies look like they will merge and we will have a very different looking night sky as the Andromeda gets closer and closer. And in a few billion years, things should look a lot different. So um, stay tuned. Now, it turns out computer models show that individual stars don't seem to collide. There's a lot of empty space in these galaxies. So individual star systems and their planets may will probably survive that, but we have some other things to work, worry about first because our sun uh, may be burning out by that point. So we have some things to think about. Okay, how do we respond to all this activity? Well, I hope we're responding with more wonder, of course, but also exploration. We want to learn more about this activity, both what's going on now in the universe, but what's gone on in the past. And one of the ways we do that, of course, is with our telescopes. Another way is when we're studying our own solar system, we can actually send out probes. And so here, for example, is the uh, Mars uh, Perseverance rover. Uh, take it, sent to Mars. It's a, Mars is a harsh environment. We hope to send astronauts there before too long, but that's not easy. So uh, for now, we've been doing a lot of scientific studies with, with uh, Martian uh, satellites and rovers to probe the Martian soil. We know that Mars now is a, is a cold, dry desert, but if you dig in the soil a little bit, you find a whole layer of water ice and you can see evidence of lakes, water lakes and water rivers that used to be on the surface of Mars. So what happened and could there have ever been microbial life there in the past and 
you know, what, what, uh, what's changed the atmosphere of Mars so much over these years? That's a hot topic of scientific study. Um, here uh, uh, is just an example of, of the progression of human curiosity and technology over the years. This is an image from the space shuttle, the last flight of the space shuttle to the Hubble Space Telescope to do upgrades. And here you can see through the window from inside the shuttle here, you can see the Hubble telescope outside the window. But in front, you see something one of the astronauts brought with him, which is a model of Galileo's telescope. And so uh, Galileo, about 400 years ago, is the first person we know of who took a telescope, which had been used for like military spying, and actually pointed it up at the heavens and started taking recorded observations of, of the moon and recorded observations of Jupiter and finding that these little pinpoints of light were orbiting Jupiter and that had all kinds of ramifications for understanding the dynamics of the solar system as a whole. But here you can see how the progression of technology and optics ever since that time, which you can visually see here between these two telescopes, has also enabled the progression of scientific understanding and also enriching the other endeavors of human life, which I would say include theology and philosophy and art and music and literature, all from how we've used technology, in this case, for something good. All right, next quality. The universe is enormous. Um, is it infinite? I don't know. There's a lot of debate about that, but we know it's enormous both in its size but also its content. So I talked to you already about this example of a globular cluster, but that doesn't mean a whole lot if you don't know the context. So I'm going to um, take an image now from a different telescope that sees a wider swath of the sky looking toward the center of our own Milky Way. So we're looking kind of along the disk of our galaxy and you see a lot of stars at the center of our galaxy area and those dusty lanes, a lot of dust, a lot of gas. And we're gonna zoom in, if this will work for me, from this image to one of these bright star-like objects and then transition to other telescopes that can see more detail and then zoom in finally to what the Hubble sees. So you can see things in context. So let's see, okay, so here's the constellation Centaurus. We're zooming into one of those objects that looks like a star, but now you can see it's actually a cluster. This is a globular cluster of stars. And now as we dive into the center of that cluster, we see the Hubble image that tells us those individual stars that you saw before. So, do you see how seeing things in context is really helpful? Um, and that's applicable to many facets of life. Um, do you want to see that again? Let's, all right, let's see if I can make that happen again. Okay. All right, here is the con. I don't like this violent constellation, but nevertheless, it's Centaurus zooming in to one object that turns out, oh, that's one of those very dense globular clusters. And now we're going to zoom into the Hubble detail in the core of that cluster. All right. So we need the telescopes that give us the big picture, the wide swaths to give us the context to detect things. And then we need other telescopes that can zoom in on the detail and give us a more information. All right, I've told you about galaxies, but there are a lot of galaxies. One of the most famous images of Hubble is looking at a direction of the sky where there weren't very many nearby stars to drown out the image and just collecting light for, um, for a long time. And this is what showed up in the final image is something called the, the ultra deep field. So these little blips of faint light that showed up on the long exposure of like 10 days of just pointing the Hubble telescope in the same direction and collecting light. Um, these are not stars in our own galaxy. I've shown you some images of stars, but this is looking outside our galaxy and every little blip of light here is actually another galaxy. So each little smudge, even the little tiny ones, can contain billions, sometimes hundreds of billions of stars. If we could get far enough away from our own Milky Way and look back, the universe would look like this and our Milky Way would look like one of those little spiral smudges up to the left or the top of this picture. 
And any direction you look in the sky, you see something similar. So our universe is filled with galaxies, and they are incredible. And of course, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but these galaxies are not all at the same distance. Some of them are closer to us, some of them are farther away. There's a third dimension here. And in astronomy, everything you look at, you're seeing it as it was in the past, because it's taken time for the light to get to us and to get to our telescope. So some of these galaxies are millions of light years away. A light year is a unit of distance. It's the distance that light travels in a year. And it gets kind of pointless to, to use miles and kilometers when you get to these enormous distances. So we talk about distance in terms of light year. Some of these galaxies are millions of light years away, so we're seeing them as they were millions of years ago, and some of them are billions of light years away, so we're seeing them as they were close to the beginning of our own universe. And now the Webb telescope is seeing its own deep fields. Um, its infrared light allows us to see some of the earliest galaxies in the universe, the light becomes shifted into the infrared where Webb sees it as it travels through space that's expanding and, and uh, lengthening the wavelengths of light on its trek to us. So um, hundreds of billions of galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars, and if those galaxies are anything like what we're learning about our own Milky Way, most of those stars have at least one planet. So if you do the math, you know, hundreds of billions of galaxies times hundreds of billions of stars in each one times hundreds of billions of planets in each one, um, you've got a lot of things to study um, in the universe. And that's just the observable universe. You know, we can only see out as far as there's been time for the light to get to us. I don't think I did the math quite right. Hundreds of billions of galaxies, hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy but if each one of those stars has one planet, that's the same number of planets as stars. Okay, need to get that right. All right, how do we respond to this magnitude? Um, well, I hope with a sense of awe, but also a sense of humility um, as well as we live in this vast universe. Um, the universe is mysterious. Um, there's a lot of things that we don't fully understand. Um, so I want to go back to... Um, this web deep field and you see the galaxies but if you look closely and by the way you see right in front that kind of thing with the with the um the spikes coming out of it that's a star in our own galaxy then the foreground star and um telescopes like Webb produce what we call diffraction spikes when you have a little point of light and it's an effect an optics effect from the mechanics, the mechanical structure of the telescope. So that's not actually coming from the star, it's actually a feature, uh, an artifact of the telescope. But the other things behind that little uh, star-looking thing are actually galaxies, and you see some of them have little curvatures to them. These are being, these are galaxies whose light is being stretched out and distorted by an effect called gravitational lensing. It means that the, the galaxies in the foreground, some of them are in clusters, and those clusters have so much mass that they actually distort space-time. Einstein said that gravity is really just a distortion of space. Well, it turns out that the mass in these clusters of galaxies distort space-time so much that light coming from more distant galaxies gets magnified and stretched out into these arcs. And we use that to study these background galaxies that are now magnified. But we also use it to, dis to study the mass in the foreground cluster because most of it is not in the visible galaxies and stars. Most of it is in what we call dark matter. We see its gravitational effects, but we don't know what it is. We can map out where it is by using this gravitational lensing tool. So how do we respond? Well, we respond with curiosity. What is this? And we respond with more exploration. Um, and we're finding new things. We're starting to detect different kinds of information. I don't know if you've heard about gravitational waves. Well, gravity waves were predicted uh, many decades ago, but very hard to detect because they're not radiation. They're distortions of space-time itself that are spawned by accelerations in space, usually when something majorly massive merges with something else and they have some combined angular momentum and the merger itself 
distort space so much it spawns a detectable distortion of space time that we are actually picking up. So here is from a few years ago. On the left, it's an artist's conception of two dead stars that have become collapsed black holes that are a binary pair that eventually, over a long period of time, they spiral in and merge together. And that process is so energetic that it releases this distortion of space-time. On the right, those are true measurements of distortion of space that are exactly what was predicted would come through if there was a merger of black holes in the distant universe. So these gravitational wave detections are becoming more frequent now. Um, we're also being able now to start taking pictures of black holes. Here's one that was imaged um, and released recently. And now we've even imaged the black hole in our own Milky Way galaxy at the center. And you say, well, how do you see a black hole? I thought light couldn't get out of a black hole. Well, that's true. Light cannot escape from a black hole. The gravitational distortion of space is too strong. But material falling into the black hole can be a circulating in what's called an accretion disk around the black hole. And that can be a very bright process. And the light can be channeled through this distorted space so that we see that bright light. And so that's how that's happening. All right, the universe is progressive. And I don't know if it's progressive in a political sense, but I do know it's progressive in a changing sense. Let me say, show you what I mean by that. So here's our deep field again. But remember that I mentioned to you that those galaxies are not all at the same distance. Um, so. If we take that deep field, and it's not easy to figure out the distances of those individual galaxies, but we can do that. So if we do that and then fly through that image with the near galaxies uh, flying past us first, we can start kind of looking at the character of these galaxies. So here's the ones that are closer to us. So we're seeing them as they are closer to us in age and in space and time. And we see some of the big spirals that we think that our Milky Way is like, but we also see some elliptical galaxies, some different shapes of galaxies. But as we move to the more distant galaxies in that ultra deep field, we start seeing some changes. Um, the galaxies are not as big. They haven't had time. These, we're looking at them at a younger stage of the universe. They haven't had time to merge and grow into these bigger galaxies. They haven't had time yet to form the big spiral structure. Um, they haven't had time for generations of stars to come and go much. And now we're seeing fewer of them as we get to the most distant galaxies. That's not because there are actually fewer of them, even though they're smaller in the early universe, but it's because the light from those early galaxies is traveling through billions of years of space time and space is expanding, and so what that, what that does is it stretches the, the light to redder wavelengths to the point where even though the light started out maybe as blue, by the time it gets to us, it's in infrared light that, that Hubble cannot pick up. Um, but we can compare some of these galaxies that are closer to us to the ones that are farther away, meaning we're seeing them farther back in time, and we see they're different in structure. They're, having, they're not as big um, in the early universe. And we can measure the chemistry of the stars and gas. And we can tell that in the earlier universe, there hasn't been enough generations of stars to produce as many heavier elements as we now have in galaxies like our own Milky Way or close to us in space and time. And now the Webb telescope is looking at some of those very early galaxies that Hubble can't even pick up because they're so shifted into the infrared. And they're seeing, here's some examples, that some of those infant galaxies are taking on uh, uh, m these micro-mergers early on. So they're growing in mass pretty early, and they're starting to build that spiral structure pretty early on. So this is really exciting to astronomers, because they're like learning that the universe had what it needed to start building galaxies pretty early on. We're talking about, you know, we think the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Well. We're talking about galaxies taking shape within the first 0.8 or even the first 0.5 of that 13.8 billion years of, of cosmic history. So that's pretty cool. So there'll be a lot more uh, discussion of that. Um, not here, but in science coming forward. How do we respond to that? Well, I hope we respond with gratefulness because it appears 
that the universe has developed over billions of years of time and it continues to mature and change with the production of stars within hundreds of billions of galaxies and their heavier elements and that's allowed subsequent generations of stars to have planets including our own sun and that's provided conditions needed for life to thrive on at least one planet um, and that could imply that the universe has purpose. All right, now I've just jumped from science to a philosophical interpretation that not everyone has. Um, but I think that, that uh, responding in gratefulness is an appropriate response. Um, and just to carry on that theme, the universe is fruitful. These stars are now producing planets. This is an artist's conception, but of a real star system that has six planets orbiting it tightly. When I was in school, we didn't know of any planets outside of our solar system. And now we know that planets, we call them exoplanets because they're outside of our solar system, are common, that most stars in the galaxy have at least one planet. And now we're studying their characteristics. We know there are many different sizes, some much bigger than the planets in our solar system. Some have planets smaller than Earth. Um, we want to know if they could be habitable. Um, uh, we, we find that even the nearest star to the sun, Proxima Centauri, has it's a little tiny star next to Alpha Centauri. Proxima Centauri has a, a planet in its habitable zone. Um, but it turns out that those little dwarf stars are also quite violent with flare, so it's not clear if, if uh, life could could exist or thrive, um, but here's an artist's conception imagining what it might be like on Proxima Centauri. So what are we to think if there might be life on other planets? Well, it kind of begs some old, rethinking of some old questions about what would the nature of life be and how do we think about the, 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 the nature of life beyond Earth. Um, C.S. Lewis wrote about the spiritual state of life possible elsewhere in his science fiction novels. So uh, you can read those novels. One of them is called Out of the Silent Planet. How do we respond to this? Well, I think that we respond with awe and gratefulness for the fact that our universe supports a life and even life that can reflect on itself. Um, particularly on our own planet Earth. And of course we wonder if there could be life, even simple life beyond Earth. So there's a whole science now of astrobiology that's trying to understand the conditions for life, uh, that could, extremes of life could exist and how we would detect it remotely because we still don't really have the capability to travel to other star systems. Um, all right, I'm going to try to do the rest of the universe and all my thinking about it in about the next 10 minutes, okay? So you know, I'm going to speed this up. All right, I've talked about how the universe is vast and beautiful and awe-inspiring, but I, I don't want to overlook the fact that the universe is, can be seen as troubling and dangerous. Um, people can look at the things I've just shown you about the enormous size and, and, and time scales of the universe and think that our own little planet is very insignificant. And in fact, in, um, in terms of time and space, we are insignificant. We're one little planet around one little star in the outskirts of one little galaxy. Um, but that begs philosophical questions. How do we describe significance? Some people can look at that same information and feel bewildered and that our lives are basically pointless. Others can look at the same information and say, wow, we've been given the gift of life. Our bodies are made of atoms that were produced in stars. We're connected to the universe, and we've been given the gift of contemplating it. Um, that's an amazing sense of significance. That's a philosophical question. Um, but we can respond to all of this with concern or fear or some people bewilderment or some with a strong sense of joy and trusting God, and all of these responses, some people can have all of these responses, right? Um, I think of Blaise Pascal, um, who back in the 17th century reflected a lot, and he was thinking a lot about time, but he said, when I consider the short duration of my life, swallowed up in the eternity before and after, the little space which I fill, engulfed in the infinite immensity of spaces of which I'm ignorant and which know me not, I am frightened. 
And I'm astonished at being here rather than there, for there's no reason why here rather than there, why now rather than then. Who's put me here? By whose order and direction have this place and time been allotted to me? And then he goes on with this famous quote, the eternal silence of these infinite spaces frightens me. Okay, very valid thought. Um, Carl Sagan, the astronomer who inspired me in many ways, but he said, who are we? We find that we live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy tucked away in some forgotten corner of the universe. <laughs> Have you ever felt like that? Um, um, that's, a, that's a perfectly legitimate reaction that many people in our culture feel because if you, again, think of significance as your place in space and time, then we're not very significant. But that's not the only way to think of significance. And, and I, I, I kind of like the way the psalmist in Psalm 8 um, described significance. The psalmist, who was probably a shepherd, had a lot of time to look at the sky, said, O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, didn't know about galaxies yet, um, that you have established, what are human beings, here's that insignificance, what are human beings that you're mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? And yet he reflected a little bit more and said, and yet you've made them, us, a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You've given them dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under their feet. Now, in this sense, the psalmist was looking up at the moon and the stars. He knew we didn't have dominion over them in terms of touching them and manipulating them, but I think of that dominion in terms of understanding, the gift of understanding, and I would put science in that realm, that the fact that we've been given the gift of exploring and curiosity and, and a scientific method of understanding um, is a sense of significance. It's a sense... I would say that of evidence that God values us and that we do have a, a, a significance that's been given to us. And that's another way of looking at significance, that perhaps our significance is apparent not from our place in, or our time span in the universe, but from the fact that we exist at all, um, that we're the product of a universe or possibly a multiverse, if there are other universes, evolving toward life and our consequential ability to contemplate good and evil and our place and our purpose in the universe. The fact that we're having this conversation at all tonight here, to me, is evidence that's consistent with um, purpose and significance. But that, these kinds of topics take us outside of what strictly science can measure and teach us. Science is a very good tool for measuring physical phenomena, but it's not the right tool for the bigger questions, the capital W, why. We need the other human uh, ways of pursuing different kinds of truth, um, philosophy, theology. Uh, Sir John Polkinghorne, who was a physicist um, in the UK and became an Anglican priest, uh, wrote many great books on science and faith, and he said that science and theology are both concerned with the search for truth. In consequence, they complement each other rather than contrast one another. Of course, these two disciplines focus on different dimensions of truth, but they share a common conviction that there is such a thing as truth to be sought. And uh, you know, a lot of some directions of our culture would say there's no such thing as, as absolute truths, but here we have two disciplines, different disciplines, but they're both pursuing truth. And so I think that's quite insightful. So let me add another observation here that the universe is beloved or beloved. Beloved is not a scientific term. And yet I believe we have evidence of this both from the things I just mentioned, the fact that we can recognize our place in the universe, that we have the gift of exploring and understanding. Um, but I believe as a Christian we've also been given some specific good news from the God of the universe. Um, we're told that God so loved the world that he became 
a part of the world, that he gave his one and only son, a human, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Um, this is amazing good news. Our bodies uh, decay, but our life uh, does not end um, uh, according to this good news. And in fact, this incarnation in terms of Christian faith is really profound. I think some of the most profound verses in the New Testament are found in the opening verses of the Gospel of John. I see that posted around this college in some beautiful artwork. But it says in this poetic way that in the beginning, you know, as physicists, we're trying to think, well, what happened first? Was there a Big Bang? What happened before the Big Bang? What were the fundamental forces? What was the fun, you know, what, what was in the beginning? And that's really important. But what scripture teaches is actually what's more important than the physical forces, which are important, but is actually a person described as the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The word became flesh. That means all the atoms created and stars and so forth. Actually, the, the word became flesh made of that same created material and made his dwelling among us. And we've seen it. We've seen his glory full of grace and truth. This is extremely profound. And Jesus himself said why he came. He came that we might have life and have it to the full. Um, this is true love. Um, I believe the gospel tells us that the universe is not only beautiful, active, and productive, but it is a gift of love. It is the portal through whom the God of the universe has revealed himself to us and has given himself to us. And we can respond in many ways, hopefully with praise and faith. We can respond also in service and love and using the science and technology that we have to serve others. Um, here's some examples. Here is a student at the Maryland School for the Blind who's enjoying some of these same pictures we've been enjoying tonight, but coated with tactile coating so that a galaxy feels different from a star, it feels different from a planet, feels different from a nebula, enabling people to enjoy the fruits of science and exploration um, regardless of their culture or their physical abilities is an act of respect and an act of love. Here's another colleague of mine, Gladys Kober, who is a data analyst at NASA. She helps produce some of these pretty images that we see, but in her vacation time, she goes and visits, visits an orphanage where the children, um, who are children of trauma, but they have food, they have clothing, thankfully. What they want from Gladys is to hear about space. So she goes and shares with them what we're discovering in astronomy, and, and it lifts their spirits. You know, sharing the knowledge and the benefits of science is an act of love and respect. Um, and in fact, when we talk about science and religion, it doesn't have to be just a kind of philosophical, sometimes a debate or a conundrum, it can be a celebration. And I like this article that came out in the Vatican Observatory's blog, and it's called Faith, Science, and a Big Parade, that really the framing of these conversations ought to be one of celebration, first and foremost. So let me just uh, close uh, by saying that we live in a universe that I hope you'll agree is awesome. Um, as we look, for example, um, here's some galaxies, pieces of galaxies seen with Hubble in ultraviolet light that show you these hot spots of star formation in different spiral galaxies, glowing regions of beautiful activity. I'm Dr. Edelman, a professor of psychology at Catholic University in Washington. Dr. Nancy Edelman said that we, scientists and people of faith, and these are overlapping groups, speak a common language, and that language is awe and wonder about the world at large. We can meet on this common ground and consider that common interest. And how do we respond? I think we can respond with praise. Here's the space window at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Um, it's got a little piece of the moon in it, so you can uh, see how the light comes through the window and inspires us both for praise and for scientific study. Um, so I hope you'll agree that the universe should be inspiring us, and it also inspires us to take care of our home planet. This is 
from the space shuttle on the last servicing mission for Hubble as the sun is rising behind the limb of planet Earth. And you see that blue arc, that's the wispy atmosphere of our home planet being backlit. And it shows you how beautiful our atmosphere is and how fragile it is. Um, we do know there's life on one planet and we need to take care of this beautiful planet um, that is our home. So I hope one of the lessons we learn from the universe is appreciation and stewardship for our own planet. If you're interested in further thought about all of this, you can take a picture of this um, list of resources. Uh, uh, these are my favorite books and organizations that help really fertilize a, a positive and, and, and intriguing interface between science, ethics, technology, and, and religion and faith. I particularly like the Book of the Cosmos, which is a collection of literature by uh, Dennis Danielson, and The Language of God by geneticist Francis Collins. There's some organizations I like. Uh, one of them is the Society of Catholic Scientists. One is the American Scientific Affiliation, which is a network of Christians in science. The Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion program that I used to direct for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And you see some other uh, uh, um, organizations down the list, which are very much worth checking into. So let's close by um, praising God for the universe. And let's praise God for the gift of science that allows us to explore and understand the wonders of creation. Amen? Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You are a patient audience. I think we have a, do we have a few minutes for Q&A? Now, on your way out, whenever you do have to go, um, outside the door on the table, I've left you some images uh, from space. And, and so you can take, uh, there's pictures of galaxies and, and nebulae and some of the things you've seen tonight. So you can take one or two of these with you and, and use them to uh, be inspired uh, in your own home or workspace. Um, all right, so maybe we can turn the lights back up at this point. And, and uh, are, we, are there questions? Uh, do you? Um, oh, yeah, it works. Yes. Um, so first of all, I wanted to say thank you for visiting. That was a wonderful presentation. And um, today, like I was, during the presentation, I was trying to think up of a question. But the only thing that came up to mind was the concept of time. And it's not really a physical concept like mass or volume or anything. So what I wanted to ask you was, um, since it's a popular Christian belief that God exists outside of time um, and he actually created this for us, how can you process the creation or gift um, of time as both a scientist and a Christian. Oh, that's a great separately. question. So, so yeah, time is one of the most intriguing concepts. And if you want to really blow your mind, take a physics class on special relativity or, or even general relativity and, and have your mind blown about time. Um, so time is not experienced the same way by everyone in every circumstance. That's one of the things that relativity tells us that if if you're moving relative to someone else, you experience time in a different way. So what does that mean? If time is not absolute, um, how are we to think about that? And then there's the theological question. Is God um, contained within time? If God is outside of time, what does that mean? There are different theological conclusions. I'm not, I don't pretend to be a professional theologian on this. I think you could... We have a couple of professors here who do think about science and religion professionally, so you can ask them. The way I think of it is very simplistically. So I think of time as being part of the created order. It's the, what, what we experience. It gives us the prospect of consequences for action, so there can be cause and effect because of the timeline. Time seems to go in one direction. As much as we would like to, all our science fiction movies try to go back in time, 
we haven't mastered how to do that just yet. So we're, we're still thinking of time as flowing in basically one direction, although theorists can think of lots of other possibilities. And the way I think of it, and I'm afraid that all the theologians in the room are going to come after me and tell me how I'm wrong, but um, is that God is outside of time, so God can see the beginning and the end. Um, and Jesus himself, you know, is described as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. That applies like a timeline, but seeing it all does not necessarily mean dictating it all. So we have some freedom within our own experience, within our own timeline. The universe itself has freedom. The fundamental physical forces of nature have some fundamental uncertainties in them. And so we can experience cause and effect of the time and the choices we make have consequences according to a timeline. God can see what's happening and could see what's going on, but does not necessarily dictate what's going on. So we still have some freedom of choice, but that's the way that I see it. Okay, I, I, I know that there's going to be lots of opinions out there on that one. All right, another question, yes. Um, what's your favorite planet? My favorite what? Your favorite planet? Oh, my favorite planet. Um, well, I'm particularly fond of Earth because we have <laughs> we have all these different places to go, and we have all these different kinds of life in the oceans and on continents, and um, it's a beautiful planet. And and I like the fact we have all these different kinds of creatures on this planet. So that's why it particularly hurts me when, when we don't treat each other or other creatures kindly. But if I have to look beyond Earth, um, I would say that my other favorite planets are not planets, but actually they're moons. I really like the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. In particular, I like the moon Europa and, and, um, and the, the moons Europa and Ganymede, um, these are ice-covered moons that seem to have oceans under the crust of ice. So I think those really cool, and I'm looking forward to learning more about them as we send probes to them and things like that. What about you? What's your favorite planet? I like Saturn and Venus. And why is that? Um, I like how even though Venus isn't the closest planet to the sun, it's the hottest and all of Saturn's moons. Excellent. And Venus is beautiful, too. I mean, I wouldn't want to go there. It's so hot, but, uh, but it's pretty, yeah. And, and then Saturn, just like Jupiter, Saturn has a lot of moons. Which, by the way, is interesting as we look at these exoplanets. Some of those planets are not particularly habitable. They're big gas giant things, but they might have moons that are habitable. So that's something to think about. So good question. Thank you. I had one more question. Oh, goodness. Okay. Do you have any it. Does anyone have any idea what the first star might have been? The first star. Well, actually, that's a very hot topic in um, astrophysics. What, when did the very first stars form and what were they like? And, you know, using the completely obvious nomenclature of astronomy, those are called population three stars, the first ones. Okay, so, um, yeah, scratch your head on that one. But the question is, do, using theor theory, you know, understanding physics and the theory of physics, it would seem that the first stars to form out of the first gas so as the universe, I didn't go through all the history of the universe here, but we believe the universe as we understand it began with this epic of inflation um, that we sometimes uh, uh, mix in with this concept of a, of a big bang, which is an unfortunate phrase because it makes you think of an explosion. But there was a, an energetic time of the beginning of the universe we're experiencing. And as that universe expanded and cooled, atoms could finally form and then atoms could coalesce gravitationally into clouds of gas and it's if you, it's once you get clouds of gas with a little bit of density um, uh, variations you can finally get some clumps that can collapse under their own gravitational pull so you would get those first stars but those first stars would be really massive and very simple, made mostly of hydrogen they wouldn't live very long, they would uh, um, come and go quickly and the hope is that the new Webb telescope might actually be able to see some of those first generation stars in those very early galaxies that it's looking at now. Those stars, however, wouldn't last very long, so it's a real 
tough thing. So theoretically, we know they would be big, hot, simple, and short-lived. Um, but I don't know if we could tease out the very first star. We could probably hope to find some from that first generation of stars. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Doesn't anybody on this side of the room care about the universe? Okay. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. I just didn't want to crawl over people to get there. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, it, there's been plenty of controversy about uh, funding for s science in space and that humans, to send humans up is really expensive. So I'm wondering if it's worth it, and from your point of view, or whether we can just count on instruments to get us the information we'd like to have. Yeah, so, so the question is, um, the real question is, why do humans go into space? And I have this conversation frequently because you see, I, I, as you've seen, I'm an astronomer and I think of exploring space means that we send, you use telescopes and we send probes to scientifically learn about the content and the history of the universe. My husband is a biomedical engineer who gets grants from NASA to study how humans can adapt to being in space and for longer and longer term. And, you know, human space flight is another way of exploring the nearby universe, exploring the solar system. And um, this is taking on new fervor as private companies are now able to send humans at least into low Earth orbit and possibly to the moon. Um, NASA's gearing up to potentially send astronauts back to the moon and also to Mars. There's this whole program called Artemis. Uh, so there's a lot of, of um, challenges for human well-being in long-term space flight. Our physiology is, is challenged. But also there's the question of why are we doing this, who's paying for it, who benefits from it. Um, are commercial companies um, properly regulated? I mean, there's some issues right now. A lot of commercial companies are putting up satellites now for... Earth communications for internet service. Tens of thousands of communication satellites are being launched into space. Well, those are creating a lot of problems for professional astronomy right now. So, um, because they, they pollute the images. So, you know, these are not necessarily bad things in their own right, but they, they conflict. Who gets to decide the policies of these things? Um, commercial space flight, well, it's commercial space flight. So, if, you know, if they find some sort of economic advantage to taking material or people into space, they will build on that advantage. But the question is, you know, who benefits? Are there any uh, harms to this? Um, who does the moon belong to? You know, that there's all kinds of international treaties in the past, but now with this kind of new space race going on, it's not clear whether all of those policies have been agreed to. Um, so I'm not answering your question. I'm just agreeing with you that there's a lot of there's a lot of challenges because things are changing. Space flight is now becoming more common. Uh, many more countries are entering into spacefaring capabilities, and uh, many more people will be going into space, near space, low Earth orbit, and things like that as these commercial companies make that more possible. So there are some things to think about, but these are realities that are opening up in the near-term future. So thanks for the question. Sorry I didn't answer it. Any more questions? Yeah, that's right. Hi, I'm Lincoln. Um, I just wanted to ask you about, um, well, I have a lot of things I would love to ask you about, but one thing in particular, um, I aspire to be a, a physicist or an astrophysicist, something in that field. Yep. And I find that often, at least in the environment that I um, participate in at the prep school over there, okay. um, we tend uh, STEM classes tend to be riddled with a lot of competition and and a lot of I mean like it's a tense it's a tense field mm. with a lot of exploratory discoveries and cutting edge people want to be the person to discover right um, I wonder how have you um, how have you I guess the right word would be to cope with that or to to f encourage the um, exploration and enc encourage this this wonder that you've just so well elegantly described um, in this competitive and often almost cutthroat um, business uh, slash field? I, don't, I just don't know how to. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So, I mean, there are a lot of fields that are kind of competitive and, um, and I'm not that way at all. I mean, I'm, I'm this type B here. So, um, so um, I think you have to think, you know, for yourself, why do I wanna be in this field? 
Um, I'm not the best astrophysicist on the planet, and so if I was trying to be, I would be very discouraged. But I want to be part of this enterprise in some little way. And so if I have the chance to be part of this enterprise in some way that uses the mix of interests and skills that I have, I'm grateful for that. And you have a unique set of interests and skills, and so does everybody else. So I think first you have to ask yourself, why do I want to be in this field? Not why is that person in this field, or why is that person in this field? Why do I want to be in this field? The next thing I encourage for students is to try to get, get internships. So internships are little short-term experiences um, that you can get usually as an undergraduate student in the summers or sometimes during the semester, either with a professor here at a local university or at a science facility. And NASA has internships. You can look up intern.nasa.gov. And um, these are short-term experiences that help you get a sense for what it's like to actually work in the field. So it turns out that all that competition in the classroom and stuff is not really what it's like when you get in the field. And so you don't need to worry too much if, you know, you feel like um, you're not, uh, you know, climbing to the top of the pack in the class or you don't even want to, um, you don't need to because when you're actually in the field of science, you're joining a group and the most productive scientists are the ones who work well in groups and, and can be constructive in teamwork. So internships help you sample what it's like to work in a scientific environment. It doesn't have to be an internship in something that you want to do for the rest of your life. It can be any kind of internship, but in particular something related to science or engineering. And I had two or three different kinds of internships when I was an undergrad, and I didn't end up doing any of those three things. They were loosely space-related, but they helped me understand what it was like. Really helpful. Graduate student level, you can also get internships, and they can also feed into your actual research that you end up doing at the graduate. And like I say, when you get into graduate school, if you find a good advisor, they'll help you find a niche for your own, what you can get involved with that you like. So um, you don't need to, if you find yourself in a really stressful group, um, you may have to finish that class or whatever, but you don't have to intentionally keep yourself in that kind of environment. Um, science can actually be pleasant and fun. So, okay. That's very comforting. Thank yes. you. Yes. Good, we have someone from this side of the room. All right, excellent. Can you describe how you happened to discover a comet? Yes. Um, here, I'll put my praise slide up for that one. So um, uh, I'll, I'll give you uh, three answers, and then my host will probably say, ah, that's enough. Um, yes. The first answer is the practical answer. I was a senior undergraduate. I looked, I mentioned the internships. Well, you look for opportunities when you can as a student to do unusual things. And in my undergraduate school, there was a professor who took a group of students every year out to Lowell Observatory in Arizona for two weeks in the winter to learn what astronomers actually do. So I signed up for that and I got to go and it was during that field camp, they called it, that they uh, paired me with a professor, Ted, or Dr. Ted Bowl, who's a staff astronomer there who just recently passed away, but I'm very grateful to him. And he taught me how to analyze these photos that had been taken with a telescope out there of one direction of the night sky um, using something called a blink comparator. And it, would it would compare, this is like a mechanical machine, but you'd take these two images. At that time, they were taken on glass plates. You'd take the two glass plates, put them in the machine side by side. They were the same region of the sky, so you'd see a, a field of stars in the background. And th there were a few hours between the, the pictures, so the stars didn't move in just a few hours. But anything in the foreground like in the nearby solar system that might be moving quickly relative to the background stars would jump in position between those two images. So the blink comparator just allowed you to quickly blink between one picture and the other, just line by line, it's very tedious. And I was supposed to find a whole field of asteroids in this field, that was my assignment. I didn't find a single asteroid, it took hours, but I found this other funny looking thing that had a long tail, it looked like a comet, so I went and 
said, Dr. Bowl, I think I found a comet. And he was probably rolling his eyes, like, I've got to deal with this undergrad for two more weeks. I'm not going to do. But he looked at it, and, he said, and then he's like, well, that does look unusual. So then we measured its position and then went back out to the telescope. The astronomer that actually took the pictures was named Brian Skiff. He's still on the staff there at Lowell Observatory. Found it again. It had been several days, and it turns out that it um, was a comet that had not been discovered before. There's a group up in Cambridge, Massachusetts called the Minor Planet Center. I bet you've never heard of the Minor Planet Center that keeps track of all the known comets and asteroids in our solar system. And there were no known comets or asteroids that would have been in those positions at those times. So they deemed it a new comet. They sent out a telegram around the world. Other astronomers in Japan confirmed it. And I had nothing to do with naming it, but they have this, this, um, this strategy of naming these things, and so they named it after myself and Brian Skiff, who was the astronomer who had taken the pictures on which I had found the comet. So it's named Comet Wiseman-Skiff. It comes back every six and a half years. That's, a, that's the good news. You can Google it and find it. Um, the bad news, it's very dim, so you won't see it unless you have a really, really powerful professional telescope. Um, the second answer to your question is God's grace, and that's really the ultimate answer for everything. Because I was a senior, I didn't have a thesis topic in my school. You had to have a thesis to graduate. It was January. I didn't even have a topic. Um, and I was praying for help, and, and then this happened, and, and I studied that comet for the next few months, did more observations, and that became my senior thesis. Now, my prayers are not always answered in such a stellar fashion, but, uh, but I think of it as God's answer to prayer comet, but it's also a lesson of grace and provision for me because decades later, what people ask me about are not the years of research I subsequently did in star formation. It's important, and I you know, dedicated my research life to doing radio astronomy observations of star forming clouds, and I think did some important work. And that's good, and I'm glad, thankful for that. But what people want to know about is the comet, which was basically a gift um, that I happened to be in the right place at the right time. So I praise God for that. It's a reminder of God's provision and God's grace. Um, I didn't mention prayer tonight, but I, I want to mention that as a Christian, one of the greatest privileges we have is to talk to God, the God of the universe I just described. You can have a personal relationship with God as revealed to us in Jesus Christ, and that prayer life helps me personally, helps me through professional dilemmas, uh, things that are not so glamorous as finding a comet, but other things, and having that relationship with God is, is, is a gift, a part of the gospel. The third answer to your question is that many people gave of themselves to enable me to be in that place at that time. I think of all the people I described to you, my parents who sacrificed so I could go to college, the people at my home family who encouraged me to reach high, do seek what I'm interested in, people at my church that encouraged us uh, with love to go forward and, and, and use our gifts and develop them develop them. I think of that professor who took students out every year. It, probably he got tired of that sometimes, but Jim Elliott, a professor at MIT, volunteered his time to take students out to Lowell Observatory for two weeks in the middle of winter every year and gave me that opportunity. I think of the people at the facility there who gave of their time to mentor students. It's a distraction to have students sometimes. It takes time to mentor them. Um, I think of the people who enabled me to have these opportunities. I haven't mentioned them all. Family, teachers, culture, society. Um, I benefit from privilege that I you know, didn't earn. And so uh, many people around the globe don't have those same opportunities that I've had. So one of the things we can all do is look around and make sure that the the opportunities and privileges and opportunities we've been given that we don't take those for granted and we try to make sure that we open doors for other people for whom those opportunities have not traditionally been given. All right, so that's a three-pronged answer to your question. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Yes. <laughs>